Do you have to wear shoes up here? Can I go barefoot? Just to increase the hippie stereotype. Is that cool? Yeah? All right. Um, at my office, there's two rules. You can't drink beer before 4.30, and you have to wear shoes. So I try to take advantage of it whenever I can. Plus, it's cold in Colorado right now, so might as well. Uh, so I'm here to talk about hacking with gems. Um, it's not hacking on gems or hacking like you usually think about Hackfest or anything. This is actually hacking. This is actually getting credit card numbers or passwords. This is real hacking. Um, and a lot of people confuse that. Um, so I was thinking maybe I should just change the title of this talk to how to get rich quick and maybe not go to jail. I don't know. Listen to the talk and tell me what you think. Maybe give me some feedback. Um, you'll, you'll see about why later. Um, so a little bit about who I am. Um, like Josh said, my name is Ben Smith. I usually just go by Ben, um, although Ben Smith is the most common name on the internet, so I try to make it a little bit more unique by going by, with uh, Benjamin. I've been doing Rails since uh, version 116, so a while now. Um, I work at Pivotal Labs. Um, it's a Rails consultancy in the, in the States. We have offices in SF, Boulder, Denver, and New York. Um, we used to have an office in Singapore, but unfortunately sold that one. Um, but we are opening new offices, so we're opening one in LA, Boston, and London, and hopefully eventually we'll have one down here. So if you guys keep uh, having Ruby conferences and you know, supporting startups and stuff, you might see us down here. And I would love to come down here and work in Australia and get to surf every day. That'd be great. Um, like I said, I'm in the Boulder office, I'm right in the middle of the United States, at the foot of the Rocky Mountains where right now it's just dumping new snow. And every time I go out of town, this happens, and my friends get to enjoy this crazy powder. Um, but um, that's fine. I'm actually enjoying it here. Here's a picture of me last year. If you enjoy skiing, come to Colorado, come visit. It is just the best. Um, but yeah, it's great to be here. It's nice and warm. I get to wear shorts for the first time in the last four months. Um, now, a little bit about what I'm not. I'm actually not a security expert. Um, I have a fascination in it. I go to DEF CON every year. Um, I go to DEF CON and 90% of the content goes way over my head. Um, I'm, just a, I'm just a Rails developer. I'm, I'm a noob. Um, and the reason why I'm telling you this is not because I want you to get up and leave and be like, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. It's because when I show you this code, when I show you these gems, keep in mind that this was all written by a complete noob. Anyone can do this. Um, that being said, anyone can do this. Please don't try this at home. <laughs> um, it'd be actually better if you just forgot <laughs> everything I'm about to tell you, except for the last few slides. Um, and this, this picture doesn't really do a good job. That actually looks like a horrible idea. Who would want to do that? But when you see some of the, these examples, they're actually kind of cool. And you're like, wow, that's kind of neat. I should do that. Don't, don't do that. Don't do that. Um, so you know, with, with this knowledge, if you can do that, you know, use that knowledge wisely. Um, all right, so let me talk about how I got started on this topic. Uh, a, a couple of years ago, a client asked me, what's in my Rails app? Um, you know, what dependencies do I have? And he was a little bit worried about having too many dependencies that he didn't know about and wanted to have some sort of handle on that and just, you know, be aware of what was going on. So I showed him the gemfile.lock and um, that basically satisfied his curiosity. But it sparked my curiosity and it got me wondering, what's the worst possible thing that could happen? What if there was a dependency in here that was malicious? What, what could it do? Um, and if you generate the dependency diagram of all the gems in Rails, just from standard Rails app, this is what it looks like. There's 39 gem dependencies, and this is a visual representation of it. So what if one of those 39 dependencies had something that was malicious? What, what, what's the worst possible thing that you guys could think could happen? I thought, you know, well, maybe this client who has customers, maybe their private data gets compromised, and the customers lose faith in the product, and then it falls over, goes downhill, and we lose that, that client, and we don't get paid, and all this other bad stuff. Um, so, you know, compromising data, that sounds like a pretty bad one. And I thought, well, how hard would it, would it be to write a gem that did that? So I decided to try. Um, and I decided right away that no one would just install a gem that is openly malicious, that's gonna hack you. So I had to come up with something that was 
not malicious, something maybe useful. So I wrote this awesome Rails flash messages. Um, it's arguable whether or not this is actually useful, but at least it doesn't just hack you, right? Um, so if you take a Rails app and you have you know, some flash message, beer was successfully created, and you add this gem, you get beer was successfully created, <laughs> all caps, a bunch of explanation marks with some ones in there. Um, so much better, completely useful, uh, but it also has some side effects. So if you poke around the code, you might notice some odd things like this line of code. Um, and if this line of code evaluates to true, then some more code runs. Um, it writes your params to something called development.log that's under your public directory. Uh, and then on top of that, just for good measure, it also writes your params, posts them out to a web service someplace. Not really sure where. That's interesting. Um, so going back to that line, um, this is basically saying um, if your params has password in it. So if somewhere in the params that got posted to your server, there's password. Um, so anytime the Rails app receives a request that has password, um, it writes to that development.log file and it posts to some web service. So in your development.log, development.log, quote unquote, um, you end up with clear text, username, or, uh, emails, and passwords. And since it's under the public directory, all I have to do is to go to your app slash development.log and I can just view this. Um, of course, I don't actually need to do that because it's actually posting to a server that I own as well. And I can also see emails and passwords there in plain text. So they're, they're not filtered. They're not the you know, hash passwords in the database. These are what the user entered in their browser. Uh, so that's, that's kind of interesting, right? Um, so there's this meme out on the internet that you guys might be aware of. Um, basically it goes like, step one, do something. Step two, do something else. Step three is always question marks. I'm not really sure why that is. And then step four is always profit, because that's what we want to do. We want to profit here. Um, so if I was going to fill this in with some concrete actions, it might look like this. Write a gem that does something. All right, got that. Add code to harvest emails and passwords. Yep. Instead of question marks, uh, we could actually use those emails and passwords. So you go to banking websites and try to transfer funds, which you can probably pretty safely assume that people are reusing their passwords. So you might get some uh, traction on this. And then step four, of course, is profit. Um, but after step four, I think you actually need a step five here, which is flee the country. <laughs> I don't know what the laws are here, but in the States, if you did this, you'd probably go to jail, so you might want to leave. Um, and I also don't know a ton about extradition laws, but I do know that there's 54 countries that the United States does not have extradition laws with. <laughs> so if you want to come visit me, I'm probably going to be in one of these countries. Um, I was actually Googling around to get this list of countries the other day. And as I was doing it, I was wondering, who would actually put into Google what countries <laughs> does not extradite to the United States? Well, so, so hopefully I'm not on some watch list somewhere, because the only people that would Google that are obviously cr criminals. Uh, but, but anyways, uh, enough dreaming of, of moving to some small island off of India. Um, let's get back to the Ruby code. Um, so I wrote that first malicious gem, and I thought, well, that was easy, what else can I do? Uh, so I wrote another gem. Um, and this one I decided to actually write a gem that would detect my previous hack. So this one detects calls out to net HTTP um, and logs them. So if I was using that awesome Rails flash message gem um, in standard out or in you know, development log, log or production.log, you'd see something like this, basically telling me that you know, my params got posted out to some web service um, and you know, that would tell me that something was fishy. Um, and if you look at how this works, it defines um, post form, which logs out you know, whatever is going on. And then it also defines valid post form. So just in case you wanted to um, you know, make a call out and you didn't want it to log the fact that you know, using net HTTP, you could actually do that. But it does one more thing. So on 
one of the lines of one of the files of this gem at the very bottom, just in one line, not in five lines as it is here. Just in one line, it's uh, going and grabbing something from the internet and evaluating it. And it's actually using the valid get there, so it doesn't log it. So what do you guys think that's actually doing? Well, if we look at the code, this is, this is what it's doing. It's uh, adding a little before filter. It looks for some param called DB console. And if it sees it, it does some sort of active recordy stuff. Um, so if we took a, a standard Rails route, it could be this, it could be anything in your app. Um, and you added the DB console param to it, you would end up with a nice little interface to your database. So now, um, you know, as an outsider on your, on your website, I could do things such as show me all the users. Uh, I could make myself an admin. Why not? Um, I could create a database admin. Um, so yeah, the moral of this story is uh, just be careful of wolves in sheep's clothing. Don't trust stuff just because it says it does something. Um, if you actually wanted to do network monitoring, um, Lil Snitch is a good tool to do that. There's a lot of them out there, but this is one of them. This one's telling us that um, iTerm is running my Ruby process, and my Ruby process made a call out to some Heroku app someplace. Um, so you should use something like this if you actually want to monitor your system. Um, but anyways, if you had used that, um, that gem, you would have given me database access. So what could I do with database access? Well, where am I going to go here? I write a gem, all right? Get database access, yep. Apply for a loan to buy a boat. Uh, <laughs> again, um, in the States, it's super easy to get loans. You basically need a small amount of personal information. Um, and then you can apply for car loans, boat loans, credit cards, whatever else you want. Um, so what I would do is I'd probably apply for a boat loan, sail off in the boat. Um, profit, my favorite step, and then flee the country. Uh, so out of those 45 countries, um, let's see, 39 of them have beachfront property. If you have a boat, you got to sail there, right? So I'm probably going to end up in one of these countries. Um, but before I do that, um, I thought, well, that was pretty easy. What else can I do? So I wrote another gem, better date to us. And what it claims to do, it strips uh, extra white space from the, the 2S date formatters that you get with Rails. Um, kind of an annoyance for me, and I, I, I wrote this, and um, I thought, well, that's, that's kind of nice. Of course, that's not the only thing it does. If you're detecting a theme here, the theme is that none of these gems only do what they say they do. They actually do something very bad. Um, this one's no exception. Um, it's all a little bit of a misdirection. I'm, I'm not a magician like, um, like Keith is from, from his talk. I'm not going to throw cards everywhere, but I wish I was. So what does it actually do? Uh, it calls this set date formats for method and passes in the Rails environment and the Rails root. Um, that's pretty strange. It doesn't, seems like you, doesn't seem like you'd need that for date formats, but OK. Let's see what that method does. Uh huh. What does that method do? Um, well, no one can tell me what that does because it's a it's a it's a compiled C extension. Um, and in this case, this compiled C extension was packaged without the source, so you have no way of seeing what it does. Um, it only contains the compiled code. And um, if you wanted to see what it actually does, you'd have to come to me and be like, "Hey, show me the code, Ben." And since I'm here, I'll show you. So this is what it does. Does anyone? Want to tell me what that does? Well, if you're running this in production, um, you'd end up with uh, this file assets.tar.gz under your public directory. Um, and since it's under your public directory, I could download it. And if I did and I extracted it, I'd see something like this. Um, and if that doesn't look familiar, that's basically your app source tree. That's, your, that's all your source code. But uh, all right, to be honest, this, this gem doesn't quite work. Um, 
I could get it to work, but I'm pretty lazy. Um, this is what's known as a fat gem. So it's a gem that's pre-compiled for certain platforms. Um, and when you do that, you don't have to distribute it with a source because it doesn't need to compile wherever it's installing. Um, there's tools that allow you to do this, but I spent a couple of hours trying to do it, and I'm like, ah, this is kind of hard. And on top of that, really, what are you going to do with somebody's source? Um, sell it to their competitors? I mean, maybe, I guess. But I don't know. I feel like that's like a sting operation waiting to happen. Hey, here's the source code, and then handcuffs go on. Um, I, you can put it on eBay. Can I sell it to China? Do the Russians still buy secrets anymore? I don't know. Um, so I, I, I just gave up on that. I said, ah, that's too hard. I don't want the source. What else can I do that's easier? So I wrote another gem. Be truthy. This one's my favorite. Um, not, not much truth in this gem, but this is what it claims to do. Um, I don't know how many of you guys use RSpec, but uh, there's one pet peeve I have about RSpec, and it's that um, should be true and should be false don't actually assert against true and false. They assert against truthy and falsy. So if you say user.new that should be true, that says like, yep, that's green, that passes. But user.new is not actually true. It should be true, should be true, should pass. Whereas user.new should be true, should fail. So th this, this gem fixes that. Uh, but what does it actually do? It actually doesn't do anything. There's no code. There is zero code. There's nothing to see. Um, of course, um, I did this mostly because I was lazy. Like I had this idea. I'm like, well, I could write the code. And I'm like, ah, I'm not even going to write it. Um, I didn't even finish writing it. I just added the hack, and that was it. Um, but so if there's, if there's no, no code, then where's the actual hack? This is, this is the question, right? This is the, the confounding thing. Um, if you look at the source tree of this gem, everything looks pretty fine, pretty normal. This is basically what you get when you, when you generate a new gem. Um, and if you look at btruthy.rb, you see there's no code there. Literally, like I said, there's, there's no code. There's nothing. Um, so what's the catch here? Well, when you install this gem, whether it's you know, via gem install like I did here, or if you use Bundler, um, it'll tell you that it's building native extensions. This could take a while. Now, usually what that means is that it's going to compile some C extension. Um, but if we look back at the source tree, um, there's no C code here. There's nothing at all. Um, and that combined with, you probably don't need C code for our spec matchers. I'm not sure on that, but probably not. Um, that should spark your interest and make us dig some more. Uh, so if you look at the, the, the gem spec, this line right here, this gem.extensions, tells it um, it's usually used for compiling C extensions. But in this case, it's saying, at install time, run the rake file. Um, and keep that in mind, that's at install time. So that's when you do gem install or when you do bundle. This is going to run right away. It doesn't wait for you to require the gem. It doesn't wait for you to execute the code. It's right away when you install the gem. This rig file gets ready. Um, so where's the rig file? Well, there is no rig file. Well, that's, that's kind of tough. Um, Real quick, how many people read the source of the gems that they're worried about? Maybe they, they try using a new gem, and they look at the source to see if there's anything bad going on. Does anybody do that? Uh, a couple people, maybe. Not very many. Um, all right, well, does, does anybody use gem fetch plus gem unpack? Does anybody know what that is? Nobody? A couple people? All right, so. When you do, like I said before, when you do a gem install, it's going to download that gem from Ruby Gems and install it immediately. Um, what gem fetch does for you is it allows you to do that first step, the download step, without the install. Um, once you download that gem, then you can unpack it and see what's in that gem before the actual installation happens. Um, so in this case, um, we do a you know, gem fetch of the, of the gem and then unpack it. We could see what the source tree is. And if you notice, it looks a little bit different than before. So that installation process actually changed 
um, what's going on. You'll notice that there's the rake file, which is what we're looking for, and there's also this temp.rb file. Um, so what does the rake file do? This is a rake file that runs at install time. What does it actually do for us? It copies that um, temp.rb file into your home directory and hides it as .temp. Okay. That doesn't sound too bad yet. Um, it then adds an alias for sudo to your batch profile and points to sudo, uh, points sudo at, your, at that, temp, that, that temp file. Um, so now when you run sudo, it's going to run something completely different. <laughs> that could be bad. Um, and then lastly, it actually removes itself. This actually removes the file. So if you did a gem install, that file's just gone. You don't see it anymore. Uh, the only evidence left behind was that one line in uh, the gem install command or your bundle command that says compiling native extensions and that one line in your gem spec that said uh, run the rake file at install time. Um, you, there's also some, some tools that would help you catch something like this. Um, FS Eventer is a nice little tool that you can use that will show you file system changes. So what I like to do is start this up before I install a gem. Install the gem, it'll show you everything that it touches. So in this case, you can see it touched the dot .profile and dot .temp, which would raise a red flag. Um, but back to our gem. Um, install time and alias the sudo command something else. So what does sudo do now? Um, so this is what it does. This is, this is the code that runs when you run sudo. Um, it actually does kind of what sudo normally does. It prints out a little warning. Um, it grabs your password, and then it runs whatever command you wanted to run. That seems fine. Um, but one thing it did was it grabbed your password there in, your, in the middle. So now it has your password. So now I can do other things. And it, it does. Uh, so it enables SSH. Uh, guess what it does next? It creates a user. Cool. Uh, and then it posts out to a web service to tell it, hey, SSH is enabled on this box. So now what can I do? I can SSH into your box. Um, so what's the takeaway here? <laughs> <laughs> I, I presented some of these gems for the first time uh, over a year ago at a, a Mountain West RB. And um, this was the biggest takeaway for people. Ryan Big came up to me afterwards and he said, Ben, I'm never going to install any of your gems. Um, and, and to this day, people just don't trust me. <laughs> I, I wrote a gem yesterday and I needed someone to test it. I needed someone to install it. So I, I tweeted, I'm like, hey, could someone please install this? I promise it's not a malicious gem. And the only place I would install your gem is in a VM. <laughs> That actually sounds like a challenge to me. <laughs> <laughs> the other takeaway that I heard a year ago was, uh, should I just use Windows? None of your gems would work on Windows. And, well, I guess you're right. Um, Renee said yesterday that Windows is so much easier to set up Ruby on, so that combined with better security, I mean, maybe we should just switch to Windows, right? Um, so the one thing that really stuck with me was like, don't install my gems. I'm like, ah, that's fair enough. But I, I had an idea. Um, so how many people here are gem authors? How many people have pushed at least a gem to Ruby Gems? All right, there's a good number of you. That's awesome. That's good. Um, so my question is, how can I get you guys to install my gems? Um, you're all smart. You're getting smarter. You're not going to tr trust my gems. Um, but you do tr trust some gems, right? Um, what, what gems are trustworthy? Uh, Rails? Probably, you know, RSpec, yeah, Sinatra, almost Sinatra, yeah, those, those are probably pretty safe. Um, of course, you have to trust like all their dependencies as well, but you know, the big, the big gems like that, you're, you're probably saying like, yeah, I can just run gem install, I don't have to worry about that. It seems like a safe bet. <coughs> so if you trust those gems, how can I add my code to some of those gems? How can I get my code into some of those trusted gems? Um, I don't think this is going to be as easy as just submitting a pull request, but there, there's, there's got to be a way here. Um, so with this thought, I went back to my btruthy gem, and I added 
a little bit more code. So this again is at install time. It grabs your gem cutter credentials, your list of installed gems, and then it posts it out to a web service. So now I own your gems. If you uninstall this gem, I am now able to clone your repo, add some of my own code to your gem, build your gem, and gem push your gem up to rubygems.org. So the next person who, who installs your gems now is running my malicious code. Um, and there's no notification to you. <laughs> I could do this and you would not know unless you tried to update your own gem or if you went on to rubygems.org and looked to see what the version of your gem was currently set at. Um, you just have no notification. Um, and I was able to do this all just by grabbing the little um, gem slash credentials file, which is in a publicly readable place. No problems there. And now I own all your gems. So do people trust your gems? It's not even about me anymore. It's about you guys now. Do people trust your gems? Um, and do people who install your gems have trustworthy gems? Because once they install your gems, I'm going to own their gems too. Um, so it kind of like snowballs and becomes viral, right? And you start wondering, like, how many steps does it take before I hit one of the dependencies of Rails? And then once I get that, then it's game over, right? But there's, there's still one problem. There's still one problem I have to deal with. I still need a good way to bootstrap this. Um, how do I get you guys to install some of my gems? How do I bootstrap this viral aspect of it? Um, I've tried asking my friends to install my gems, but everyone who knows me says, nope, I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> I, I could go to my friends and be like, hey, you can ride on my boat. Let's go. But I don't think my boat's big enough. Uh, so what else could I try? I tried being popular. I wrote this social experiment gem. Um, and I wrote a script that automatically downloaded it over and over again to keep it as the most popular gem of the day. <laughs> but I only got one download. <laughs> it, was, it was such a disappointment. And actually, th this, this leaderboard doesn't exist on Ruby Gems anymore, so ah, that doesn't work. Um, how else can I get people to install my gems? Conferences are a good place. <laughs> people talk about gems all the time at conferences. I mean, even here, I've heard about values gem. Michael talked about that. Charles mentioned hamster. Uh, Keith and Mario talked about WBench, a library they, they wrote. Constantine talked about almost Sinatra, almost rack, and almost rack protection. I would actually be a little bit, little bit worried of his, his gems. I mean, not only has he talked about three of his own gems, but I have no clue what they do. <laughs> I have less clue what they do than my own gems. And my gems, I tried to be like a little abstract and, and sneaky. And he's, all his code is right there, and I, can't, I still can't tell. Um, so I mean, that would work. You could talk about a gem at a conference and get people to install <coughs> it. People do that all the time. But it still doesn't help me. It'd be great for those guys, as Constantine like, wanted to do that. That would, be, that would be great for him. But still, if I'm up here and I'm saying, hey, install this gem, nobody in here is going to install it. So with my reputation, is there some other way I can get you guys to install some gems? So I came up with an idea. Um, I came up with a way that I could ask people to install my gems without actually knowing, without them knowing it was me that asked them. Um, I went to Aloha RubyConf um, in October. And um, I wrote a gem for it. I called it Aloha RubyConf. Um, it didn't do anything too malicious. It just gra grabbed uh, usernames from whatever box it ran on. Um, and I printed out cards for it. And I left them around the conference. <laughs> I left them by the food. I left them by the swag. I left them on the side tables. Um, and the gem actually did something useful. On the back side of it, um, I don't have a picture, but on the back side, it had some examples of things you could do with it. You could print out the schedule and see like an ASCII version of the schedule. And it had an English to Hawaiian language translator. It was kind of cool. Um, so I printed out these cards, left them all over the place. And throughout the course of the conference, I got 5% of the people to install it, which actually only ended up being eight people. But eh, that was decent. 
Um, if I did the same thing here um, and I got the same level of adoption, I would have got 19 boxes. That's pretty good. I didn't do that here, so don't worry. <laughs> um, the funny thing was, too, uh, Aloha RubyConf was uh, similar to um, RubyConf Australia, where it's dual track. And so I was in one track giving this talk. And I got to this point in my slide deck, I started talking about this gem. And people were like, oh, you guys, you, you, this is all you? What are you doing? And so people started tweeting about it. Hey, Ben, social engineered us to install this gem. And right as people were tweeting, people from the other room started installing the gem. <laughs> So on one hand, I'm trying to be all sneaky about it. On the other hand, maybe all you have to do is like, just find the right group of people and say, hey, just install this. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there are some, actually some really big names that installed this gem, some surprisingly big names from our community, from some very big companies. Um, so this is one way you could bootstrap this. You could go to a conference, and you could either talk about a gem or you know, quote unquote, talk about it by leaving cards all over the place. So what happens now? Let's say someone did this. Um, and someone did this for real, what would happen? Well, RubyGem would probably go down temporarily. Um, and then it would come back up and continue to allow you to uh, install gems from it, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense, especially since they didn't know whether or not gems were compromised. Um, Heroku deploys would get restricted. And you guys would all be left wondering, are the gems that I'm about to download going to be malicious or not? And you kind of twiddle your thumbs and wonder. Um, this is exactly what happened last month when the YAML vulnerability was exploited on rubygems.org. Um, so I think if someone did this, or if I did this, this, this is what would happen. Um, and if I did this, I would end up on a beach somewhere. Um, the interesting thing about the, the YAML exploit um, from last month was that it had a very specific time when the attack occurred. Um, so luckily, they were able to say, well, we know this is when the attack occurred, so everything before this time is good, and everything after this time, after this time is questionable. So you compare good to questionable, and then you decide whether or not everything's fine. Um, in this case, um, I'm stealing gem cutter credentials, pushing gems as if I were the, the author, it becomes much harder to say, this is when the attack occurred, because it could occur over weeks, months, days, however long. And it, there's no specific point where I'm you know, tweaking some sort of exploit to get into the system. Um, so getting back to that state where you know all the gems on Ruby gems are good and unmolested would be very hard if this happened. So how do we keep this from happening? Um, there's some options. I don't really like any of them, but we could start by signing all our gems and hope that you know our private keys don't get compromised the same way the gem cutter credentials were. Um, we could also just start installing all of our gems using dash p high security. This requires that you know all of our gems are signed. Um, has anyone tried this? Do you know how far you get with this? You basically don't get anywhere. Active support is unsigned. This stuff requires a pretty high level of adoption to actually work. We could start doing sandboxing anytime you want to install a new gem or a new version of the gem. You need to install it in a sandbox, someplace that's safe where a gem could potentially trash the entire uh, box and you wouldn't have to worry about it, just so you could test it. Um, you could fork Ruby gems. You know, add notifications that says every time you publish a new version of your gems, you get a notification. Because that way, at least, when someone does steal your gem cutter credentials and pushes a new version of your gem, you're at least notified. That, that would be helpful. We could write some tools to de detect malicious code. Ideally, maybe this would get like rolled into like the gem pr publishing process. Um, but this gets really hard really quick when you start thinking about it, especially with like evaling code and all that crazy stuff. We start creating our own private gem repos. So if you know that some gems are good, you could put them in your own private repo and say, these gems in here are good. Only install from this repo. 
Um, I've actually heard of companies that are starting to do this now. Product companies that have one set of dependencies that they want to vet. They will take and they will check every line of code. They will build the gems and they will put it in their own private gem repo and only install from that repo. Um, I actually think that there's a potential for like a, a whole service around this where a company goes through and vets every version of these gems and says, you know, if you point your source at our private gem repo, then you're guaranteed to get something that does not have malicious code. Um, we could do all this stuff, and all this stuff would be great. It would be helpful. Um, it would also be very hard. Um, but the one thing I'd like everyone to do is just not try this at home. All this stuff is easy and fun, but please don't do it. Um, but maybe take away from this talk the following few things. Don't install gems you don't need to. Um, favor writing code yourself, especially if you're on Stack Overflow and you see the answer to some posts is, hey, just install this little gem that fixed your small problem you're having. Just write it yourself. Pay attention to what your gems do. Uh, if you have uh, a gem that has some RSpec matchers, expect it to not use like C extensions. Monitor your system. Lil Snitch and FS Eventer are good tools to do this. Uh, and read the source, because that's where you're going to find the nitty gritty details. Uh, and one last thing, you guys probably won't install this, but <laughs> I wrote this gem, Coleman Canary. Um, uh, canaries were used by miners like way back, long time ago, and they'd have a canary in a little cage and they'd carry it down, down into the mine. And the idea was that canaries more, were more susceptible to uh, things like carbon monoxide and stuff like that. And so if the canary died, they knew like, ugh, we better get out of here. So I wrote this gem, which basically does the same thing. Um, it goes into your environment and sees how dangerous your environment is. So it tries to modify your bash profile. It tries to post to a web service. It tries to fetch your gem cutter credentials. It tries to grab your private SSH keys and known hosts, which is one I didn't do. But um, it tries to do all those things. And this is kind of a work in progress. Um, this is actually the gem that I wrote yesterday. And I couldn't get anyone to install. So I don't know if it works. <laughs> Maybe someone would like to install it. Um, if you install it, you'll see something like this. And it says, like, here, on install time, here's where the results are. And it'll tell you, in this case, my box is completely uh, open to everything. So uh, it successfully posted to a web service. It wrote to my batch profile. It stole my gem cutter credentials. And it, was, it stole my SSH key. And I killed all four, four canaries. So check it out. Um, <laughs> it's, it's fine. <laughs> Uh, so, thanks for coming to my talk. Um, conferences always inspire me. I love coming to conferences because I learn about new gems, I, new ways of doing things. I always want to go home, go back to work, and like try out this new pattern that I learned, or you know, try using this new gem. Um, I actually hope that this talk didn't inspire you, <laughs> at least not to write any malicious gems. Um, but I hope it was at least entertaining and eye-opening. Thanks. So, do I, I don't know if I have time for questions or comments. Yeah, no, we've got a, a couple of minutes. So okay. if you've got any questions, uh, we've got. I yeah, love questions that. and ideas. One of my favorite things is to hear how you think I should hack people. <laughs> <laughs> um, this usually generates a lot of talk, and it's kind of fun, a fun thing to at least think about. Yep. Yep. And with Ruby Gems, I've felt for a long time that there's all these fun options. You put out a good gem that's useful, but other people are using their gems, and then later it's something nasty. Um, is there, can, you, can you see any way that we don't seem to play well with the um, you know, with Debian and stuff getting into their packaging system? Can you see any way of getting people to approve? And who would do it? So, question is kind of along the lines of like Ruby gems versus like um, Debian packages and all the other package management um, tools. Um, and I think some of those um, like 
those packaging systems are, are, would be a good thing to follow, like some of their processes, and like the Apache Foundation, some of that stuff, you know, that stuff is pretty trustworthy. And I think it would be great, you know, if as the Ruby community we decided to like take one of those um, practices and use that like as a role model, either the Apache Foundation or, you know, something from Debian, but um, yeah, that would be great. Other questions? Is it safe to do git clone, git repo, and then do make build, depending on whether you trust the author of the official author of the git repo? So the question is, is it, is it safe to do a git clone and then um, build the repo from your local machine? I, I would say yes. That, that would be safe. Um, the interesting thing, uh, especially with like my Aloha Ruby Comp gem, is like I had a, a Git repo and I had a Reb and everything, and it all looked very official. Um, and I, I wrote the gem with all the functionality, and then I added the malicious code let it later, built it, and pushed it to Ruby gems, but never pushed it to GitHub. So every, anyone who's looking at the code on GitHub or cloning it from GitHub wasn't actually getting what was in Ruby gems. But if you are cloning the repo and you're building it locally, basically you see exactly what's there. So that would be, you know, as safe as doing, you know, the get fetch, get unpack way of doing things. Yeah. Other questions? So a lot of your solutions were around the current infrastructure and mm -hmm. how Ruby Gems work. What would be your top suggestions if we come to the community to change the way we do things and make things more secure? Uh, so the question is about top suggestions on what we could do as a community to make things better if we basically threw everything up in the air and says, like, let's, let's figure this out, right? Um, I, I don't even know. There's people that are way smarter than me that have talked about this and are trying to figure that out right now as we speak. Actually, there's a lot of activity after um, the YAML exploit. Um, and I, I think that's going in a, in a good direction. I think people are starting to realize there's an issue now. Um, but yeah, talk to me after. Okay, well, time for one more. One more? My laptop's gone flat. Can I borrow yours? <laughs> <laughs> no. Thank you. Cool. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank you.